Welcome to the Wolf and the Crows Freelance Shit and Around Talking about Thrones <laughs> Valor Mogulis and welcome back to the audiobook of Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin Getting you hyped and up to date with all the history of the Targaryens In preparation for HBO's House of the Dragon Hopefully coming at you next year at some point We'll have to wait and see Another week, another chapter. Like, share and subscribe. Check out the Patreon. Hit the wee join button for all the extra perks. And obviously over on the Patreon, as usual, all the MP3 versions of the audiobooks. Chapter 7. A surfeit of rulers. All men are sinners, the fathers of the faith teach us. Even the noblest of kings and the most chivalrous of knights may find themselves overcome by rage and lust and envy and commit acts that shame them and tarnish their good names. And the vilest of men and the wickedest of women, likewise, may do good from time to time for love and compassion and pity may be found in even the blackest of hearts. We are as the gods made us, wrote Septon Barth, the wisest man ever to serve as the hand of a king. Strong and weak, good and bad, cruel and kind, heroic and selfish. Know that if you would rule over the kingdoms of men. Seldom was the truth of his words seen as clearly as during the 50th year after Aegon's conquest. As the new year dawned, all across the realm, plans were being made to mark a half century of Targaryen rule over Westeros with feasts, fairs and tourneys. The horrors of King Magor's rule were receding into the past. The Iron Throne and the Faith were reconciled and the young King Jaehaerys I was the darling of small folk and great lords alike from Old Town to the Wall. Yet unbeknownst to all but a few, storm clouds were gathering on the horizon and faintly in the distance wise men could hear a rumble of thunder. A realm with two kings is like a man with two heads, the small folk are wont to say. In 50 AC, the realm of Westeros found itself blessed with one king, a hand, and three queens, as in Magor's day. But whereas Magor's queens had been consorts, subservient to his will, living and dying at his whim, each of the queens of the half century was a power in their own right. In the red keep of King's Landing sat the Queen Regent Elisa, widow of the late King Aenys, mother to his son Jaehaerys, and wife to the King's Hand, Rogar Baratheon. Just across Blackwater Bay on Dragonstone, a younger queen had arisen when Elisa's daughter Alysanne, a maid of 13 years, had pledged her troth to her brother King Jaehaerys against the wishes of her mother and her mother's lord husband. And far to the west on Fur Isle, while the whole width of Westeros separating her from both mother and sister, was Elisa's eldest daughter, the dragon rider, Rhianna Targaryen, widow of Prince Aegon the Uncrowned. In the Westerlands, Riverlands and parts of the Reach, men were already calling her the Queen in the West. Two sisters and a mother, the three queens were bound by blood and grief and suffering. And yet between them lay shadows of old and new, growing darker by the day. The amity and unity of purpose that had enabled Jaehaerys, his sisters and their mother to topple Magor the Cruel had begun to fray, as long simmering resentments and divisions made themselves felt. For the remainder of the regency, the boy king and his little queen would find themselves deeply at odds with the king's hand and the queen regent, in a rivalry that would continue into Jaehaerys' own reign and threaten to plunge the Seven Kingdoms back into war. The immediate cause of tension was the King's sudden and secret marriage to his sister, which had taken the hand in Queen Regent unawares and thrown their own plans and schemes into disarray. It would be a mistake to believe that that, that was the sole cause of this estrangement, however. And other weddings that had made 49 AC the year of the three brides had also left scars. Lord Rugor had never asked Jaehaerys for leave to wed his mother, an omission the boy king took for a sign of disrespect. 
Moreover, his grace did not approve of the match. And he would later confess to Septon Barth. He valued Lord Rogar as a counsellor and friend, but he did not need a second father and thought his own judgment, temperament and intelligence to be superior to his hands. Jaharis also felt he should have been consulted about his sister, Rihanna's marriage, though he felt that slightless keenly. Queen Elisa, for her part, was deeply hurt that she had neither been advised nor invited to Rihanna's wedding on Fur Isle. Away in the West, Rihanna Targaryen nursed her own grievances. As she confided to the old friends and favourites she had gathered around her, Queen Rihanna neither understood nor shared her mother's affection for Rugar Baratheon. Though she honoured him grudgingly for rising up in support of her brother Jaharis against her uncle Magor, his inaction when her own husband, Prince Aegon, faced Magor in the battle beneath the god's eye was something she could neither forget nor forgive. Also, with the passage of time, Queen Rihanna grew even more resentful that her own claim to the Iron Throne and that of her daughters had been discarded in favour of that of my baby brother, as she was wont to call Jaharis. She was the firstborn. She reminded those who would listen and had been a dragon rider before any of her siblings. Yet all of them, and even my own mother, had conspired to pass her over. Looking back now with the benefit of hindsight, it is easy to say that Jaharis and Alisane had the right of it in the conflicts that arose during the last year of their mother's regency, and to cast Queen Elisa and Lord Rogar as villains. That is how the singers tell the tale, certainly. The swift and sudden marriage of Jaharis and Alisane was a romance unequalled since the days of Florin the Fool and his John Quayle, to hear them sing of it. And in songs, as ever, love conquers all. The truth, we submit, is a deal less simple. Queen Alyssa's misgivings about the match grew out of genuine concern for her children, the Targaryen dynasty, and the realm as a whole, nor were her fears without foundation. Lord Rugar Baratheon's motives were less selfless, a proud man, he had been stunned and angered by the ingratitude of the boy king he had regarded as a son, and humiliated when forced to back down at the gates of Dragonstone before half a hundred of his men. A warrior to the bone, Rogar had once dreamed of facing Magor the Cruel in single combat, and could not stomach being shamed by a lad of fifteen years. Lest we think too harshly of him, however, we would do well to remember Septon Barth's words. Though he would do some cruel, foolish and evil things during his last year's hand, he was not a cruel or evil man at heart, nor even a fool. He had been a hero once, and we must remember that, even as we look at the darkest year of his life. In the immediate aftermath of his confrontation with Jaharis, Lord Rugar could think of little else but the humiliation he had suffered. His lordship's first impulse was to return to Dragonstone with more men, enough to overwhelm the castle garrison and resolve the situation by force. As for the King's Guard, Lord Rugar reminded the council that the White Swords had sworn to lay down their lives for the King, and I shall be pleased to give them that honour when Lord Tully pointed out that Jaharis could simply close the gates of Dragonstone against them. Lord Rugar was undeterred. Let him. I can take the castle by storm if need be. In the end, only Queen Elisa could reach his lordship through his wrath and dissuade from his folly. My love, she said softly, my children ride dragons and we do not. The Queen Regent, no less than her husband, wished to have the King's rash marriage undone, for she was convinced that the word of it would once again set the faith against the crown. Her fears were fanned by Septim Matthias, once away from Jaharis and secure in the knowledge that his lips would not be so unshut, the septum found his tongue again, and spoke of little else but how all decent folk would condemn the king's incestuous union. Had Jaharis and Alisane returned to King's Landing in time to celebrate the new year, as Queen Alessa prayed, they will come to their senses and repent this folly, she told the council. Reconciliation might have been possible, but it did not happen. When a fortnight came and went, and then another, and still the king did not reappear at court, 
Alessa announced her intention to return to Dragonstone, this time alone, to beg her children to come home. Lord Rogar angrily forbade it. If you go crawling back to him, the boy will never listen to you again, he said. He has put his own desires ahead of the good of the realm, and that cannot be allowed. Do you want him to end as his father did? And so the Queen bent to his will and did not go. That Queen Alyssa wished to do the right thing, no man should doubt. Septon Barth wrote years later. Sad to say, however, she oft seemed at a loss as to what that thing might be. She desired above all to be loved, admired and praised. A yearning she shared with King Aeneas, her first husband. A ruler must sometimes do things that are necessary but unpopular, however. Though he knows that opprobrium and censure must follow surely. These things Queen Alessa could seldom bring herself to do. Days passed and turned to weeks and thence to fortnights. Whilst hearts hardened and men grew more resolute on both sides of Blackwater Bay. The boy king and his little queen remained on Dragonstone, awaiting the day when Jaharis would take the rule of the Seven Kingdoms in his own hands. Queen Alessa and Lord Rugar continued to hold the reins of power in King's Landing, searching for a way to undo the king's marriage and avert the calamity they were certain was to come. Aside from the council, they told no one of what had transpired in Dragonstone, and Lord Rugar commanded the men who had accompanied them to speak no word of what they had seen, at the penalty of losing their tongues. Once the marriage had been annulled, his lordship reasoned, it would be as if it had never happened as far as most of Westeros was concerned, so long as it remained secret. Until the union was consummated, it could still easily be set aside. This would prove to be a vain hope, as we now know, but to Rogar Baratheon in 50 AC it seemed possible. From a time he must surely have drawn encouragement from the king's own silence. Jaharis had moved swiftly to marry Arlsane, but having done the deed he seemed in no great haste to announce it. He certainly had the means to do so, had he so desired. Meister Culliper, still spray at 80, had been serving since Queen Visenya's day and was ably assisted by two younger maesters. Dragonstone had a full complement of ravens. At a word from Jaharis, his marriage could have been proclaimed from one end of the realm to the other. He did not speak that word. Scholars have debated ever since as to the reasons for his silence. Was he repenting a match made in haste, as Queen Alessa would have wished? Had Alessane somehow offended him? Had he grown fearful of the realm's response to the marriage, recalling all that had befallen Aegon and Rihanna? Was it possible that Septon Methus's dire prophecies had shaken him more than he cared to admit? Or was he simply a boy of 15 who had acted rashly, had no thought to the consequences, only to find himself now at a loss of how to proceed? Arguments can and have been made for all these explanations. But in light of what we now know about Jaharis the first Targaryen, they ultimately ring hollow. Young or old, this was the king who never acted without thinking. To this writer, it seemed plain that Jaharis was not repenting his marriage and had no intention of undoing it. He had chosen the queen he wanted and would make the realm aware of that in due course. But at a time of his own choosing, in a manner best calculated to lead an acceptance, when he was a man growing and a king ruling in his own right, not a boy who had wed in defiance of his regent's wishes. The young king's absence from court did not go unnoticed for long. The ashes of the bonfires lit in celebration of the new year had scarce grown cold before the people of King's Landing began asking questions. To curtail the rumours, Queen Alessa put out word that his grace was resting and reflecting on Dragonstone the ancient sea of his house. But as more time passed, with still no sign of Jaharis, lords and small folk alike began to wonder, was the king ill? Had he been made a prisoner for reasons yet unknown? The personable and handsome boy king had moved amongst the people of King's Landing so freely, seemingly delighting and mingling with them, that this sudden disappearance seemed unlike him. Queen Alice for her part, 
was in no haste to return to court. Here I have you to myself, day and night, she told Jahars. When we go back, I shall be fortunate to snatch an hour with you, for every man in Westeros will want a piece of you. For her, these days on Dragonstone were an ideal. Many years from now, when we are old and grey, we shall look back upon these days and smile, remembering how happy we were. Jaharis himself no doubt shared some of these sentiments, but the young king had other reasons for remaining in Dragonstone. Unlike his uncle Magor, he was not prone to bursts of rage, but he was more than capable of anger, and he would never forget nor forgive his deliberate exclusion from the council meetings wherein his marriage and that of his sisters were being discussed. And whilst he would always remain grateful to Rugor Baratheon for helping him to the Iron Throne, Jaharis did not intend to be ruled by him. I had one father, he said to Meister Culper, during those days on Dragonstone. I do not require a second. The king recognised and appreciated the virtues of the hand, but he was aware of his flaws as well. Flaws that had become very apparent in the days leading up to the Golden Wedding when Jaharis himself had sat in audience with the lords of the realm while Slood Rogar was hunting, drinking and deflowering maidens. Jaharis was aware of his own shortcomings too, shortcomings he intended to rectify before he sat on the Iron Throne. His father, King Aenys, had been slighted as weak, in part because he was not the warrior that his brother Magor was. Jaharis was determined that no man would ever question his own courage or skill at arms. On Dragonstone he had Sir Merrill Bullock, commander of the castle garrison, his sons Sir Ellen and Sir Hard, a second master at arms in Sir Ellis Scales and his own seven, the finest fighters in the realm. Every morning Jaharis trained with them in the castle yard, shouting at them to come at him harder, to press him, harry him and attack him in every way they knew. From sunrise till noon, he worked with them, honing his skills with sword and spear and mace and axe, whilst his new queen looked on. It was a hard and brutal regime. Each bout ended only when the king himself or his opponent declared him dead. Jaharis died so often that the men of the garrison made a game of it, shouting, the king is dead, every time he fell, and long live the king when he struggled to his feet. His foes began a contest, wagering with one another to see which of them could kill the king the most. The victor, we are told, was young Sir Pate the Woodcock, whose darting spear purportedly gave his grace fits. Jaharis was off bruised and bloody by evening, to Alison's distress, but his prowess improved so remarkably that near the end of his time in Dragonstone, old Sir Elis himself told him, Your grace, you will never be a king's guard, but if by some sorcery your uncle Magor himself were to rise from the grave, my coin would be on you. One evening, after a day in which Jaharis had been severely tested and battered, Meister Culliper said to him, Your Grace, why do you punish yourself so harshly? The realm was at peace. The young king only smiled and replied, The realm was at peace when my grandsire died. But scarcely had my father climbed onto the throne that foes rose up on every side. They were testing him to learn if he was strong or weak. They will test me as well. He was not wrong, though his first trial, when it came, was to be of a very different nature, one that no amount of training in the yards of Dragonstone could possibly have prepared him for. For it was his worth as a man and his love for his little queen that were to be put to the test. We know very little about the childhood of Alison Targaryen, as the fifth born child of King Aenys and Queen Elisa, and a female observers at court found her of less interest than her older siblings, who stood higher in the line of succession. From what little has come down to us, Alison was a bright but unremarkable girl. Small but never sickly, courteous, biddable, and a sweet smile and a pleasing voice. To the relief of her parents, she displayed none of the timidity that had afflicted her elder sister Rihanna as a small child. Neither did she exhibit the willful and stubborn temperament of Rihanna's daughter, Aria. As a princess of the royal household, Alicene would of course have had servants and companions from an early age. As an infant, certainly she would have had a wet nurse, like most noble women, 
Queen Elisa did not give suck to her own children. Later, a maester would have taught her to read and write and do sums, and a scepter would have instructed her in piety, deportment, and the mysteries of the faith. Girls of common birth would have served as her maids, washing her clothes and emptying her chamber pot, and in good time she would certainly have taken ladies of a like age and noble blood as companions, to ride and play and so. Alassane did not choose these companions for herself. They were selected for her by her mother, Queen Elisa, and they came and went with some frequency. To ascertain that the princess did not grow too fond of any of them. Her sister Rihanna's penchant for showering an, an unseemly amount of affection and attention on a succession of favourites, some of whom were considered less than suitable, had been the source of much whispering at court, and the Queen did not want Alassane to be the subject of similar rumours. All this changed when King Anus died on Dragonstone and his brother Magor returned from across the narrow sea to seize the Iron Throne. The new king had little love and less trust for any of his brother's children, and he had his mother, the Darger Queen Visenya, to enforce his will. Queen Elisa's household knights and servants were dismissed, together with the servants and companions of her children, and Jaharis and Alassane were made wards of their great aunt, the fearsome Visenya. Hostages in all but name, they spent their uncle's reign being shuttled between Driftmark, Dragonstone and King's Landing at the will of others, until Visenya's death in 44 AC offered Queen Elisa an opportunity to escape, a chance she seized with alacrity, fleeing Dragonstone with Jaharis, Alassane and the Blade, Dark Sister. No reliable accounts of Princess Alassane's life after the escape survive to this day. She does not appear again in the annals of the realm until the final days of Magor's bloody reign, when her mother and Lord Rugar rode forth from Storm's End at the head of an army, whilst Alassane, Jaharis and their sister Rihanna descended on King's Landing with their dragons. Undoubtedly, Princess Alassane had handmaids and companions in the days that followed Magor's death. Their names and particulars have not come down to us, unfortunately. We do know that none of them came with the princess when she and Jaharis fled the Red Keep on their dragons. Aside from the seven knights of the Kingsguard and the castle garrison, cooks, stable hands and other servants, the king and his bride were unattended on Dragonstone. That was hardly proper for a princess, let alone a queen. Alassane must have her household and in that her mother, Alessa saw an opportunity to undermine and perhaps undo her marriage. The Queen Regent resolved to dispatch to Dragonstone a carefully selected company of companions and servants to see to the young Queen's needs. The plan, Grandmaster Benefer assures us, was Queen Alessa's, but it was one that Lord Rugar assented to gladly, for he saw at once a way to twist it to his own ends. The aged Septon, Oswick, who had performed the wedding rites for Jaharis and Alassane, kept the Septon Dragonstone. But a young lady of royal birth required one of her own sex to see her religious instruction. Queen Elisa sent three, the formidable Septa Isabel and two well-born novices of Alassane's own age, Laria and Edith. To take charge of the serving girls and maids of Alassane's household, she dispatched Lady Lucinda Tilly, the wife of the Lord of Riverrun whose fierce piety was renowned through all the land. With her came her sister, Ella of House Broom, a modest maid whose name had briefly been offered as a match for Jaharis. Lord Seltiger's daughters, so recently scorned by the hand as being chinless, breastless and witless, were included as well. We had all as well get some use of them, Lord Rugar supposedly told her father. Three other girls of noble birth made upon the remainder of the company, one each from the Vale, the Stormlands and the Reach. Janice of House Templeton, Corian of House Wild and Rosamond of House Ball. Queen Alessa wanted her daughter attended by suitable companions of her own age and station, no doubt, but that was not her sole motivation in sending these ladies to Dragonstone. Septa Isabel, the novices Edith and Lara, and the deeply pious Lady Lucinda and her sister had a further charge. 
It was the hope of the Queen Regent that these fiercely righteous women might impress upon Alassane, and mayhaps even Jaharis, that for brother to lie with sister was an abomination in the eyes of the faith. The children, as Elisa persisted in calling the King and Queen, were not evil, only young and willful. Suitably instructed, they might see the error of their ways and repent their marriage before it tore the realm apart, or so she prayed. Lord Rugar's motives were baser. Unable to rely on the loyalty of the castle garrison or the knights of the King's Guard, the hand needed eyes and ears on Dragonstone. All that Jaharis and Alassane said and did was to be reported back to him. He made clear that Lady Lucinda and the others. He was especially anxious to learn if and when the King and Queen intended on consummating their marriage. That, he stressed, must be prevented. And mayhaps there was more. And now, unfortunately, we must give some consideration to a certain distasteful book that appeared in the Seven Kingdoms some 40 years after the events presently being discussed. Copies of this book still pass from hand to hand in the low places of Westeros and may oft be found in certain brothels, those catering to patrons able to read, and the libraries of men of low morals, where they are best kept under lock and key, hidden from the eyes of maidens, good wives, children, and the chast and pious. The book in question is known under various titles, amongst them, Sins of the Flesh, The High and the Low, A Wanton's Tale, and The Wickedness of Men. But all versions bear a subtitle, A Caution for Young Girls. It purports to be the testimony of a young maid of noble birth who surrendered her virtue to a groom in her lord's father's castle, gave birth to a child out of wedlock, and thereafter found herself partaking of every sort of wickedness imaginable during a long life of sin, suffering and slavery. If the author's tale is true, parts of its strained credulity, during the course of her life she found herself a handmaiden to the Queen, the paramour of a young knight, a camp follower in the disputed lands of Essos, a serving wench in Mare, a mummer in Tyrosh, the plaything of a corsair queen in the Balalisk Isles, a slave in Old Volantis, where she was tattooed, pierced and ringed, the handmaid of a Carthian warlock, and finally, the mistress of a pleasure house in Lice, before ultimately returning to Old Town in the Faith. Purportedly, she ended her life as a septa in the Starry Sept, where she sat down this story of her life to warn other young maids not to do so as she had done. The last vast details of the author's erotic adventures need not concern us here. Our only interest is in the early part of her sordid tale, the story of her youth. For alleged author of A Caution for Young Girls is none other than Corian Wilde, one of the girls sent to Dragonstone as a companion to the Little Queen. We have no way to ascertain the veracity of her story, nor even whether she was in truth the author of this infamous book. Some argue plausibly that the text is a product of several hands, for the style of the prose varies greatly from episode to episode. Lady Corrin's early history, however, is confirmed in the accounts of the Meister, who served at the Rain House during her youth. At the age of 13, he records, Lord Wilde's younger daughter was indeed seduced and deflowered by a surly lad from the stables. In a caution for young girls, this lad is described as a handsome boy her own age, but the Meister's account differs, painting the seducer as a pox-scarred varlet of 30 years distinguished only by a male member as stout as a stallion's. Whatever the truth, the surly lad was gelded and sent to the wall as soon as his deed was known, whilst Lady Corian was confined to her chambers to give birth to his base-born son. The boy was sent away soon after birth to Storm's End, where he would be fostered by one of the castle stewards and his barren wife. The bastard boy was born in 48 AC, according to the Meister's journals. Lady Corian was carefully watched afterward, but few beyond the walls of the rain house knew of her shame. When the raven came to summon her to King's Landing, her lady mother told her sternly that she was never to speak of her child or her sin. In the red keep, they will take you for a maiden. But as the girl made her way to the city, escorted by her father and brother, 
They stopped for a night at an inn on the south bank of Blackwater Rush, beside the ferry landing. There she found a certain great lord awaiting her arrival. And here the tale grows even more tangled. For the identity of a man at the inn is a matter for some dispute, even amongst those who accept a caution for young girls to contain a modicum of truth. Over the years and centuries, as the book was copied and recopied, many changes and amendments crept into the text. The masters who labour at the Citadel copying books are rigorously trained to reproduce the original word for word, but few mundane scribes are so disciplined. Such septums, septas and holy sisters as copy the Illuminati books for the faith off strike out or alter any passages they believe to be offensive, obscene or theologically unsound. As virtually the whole of a caution of young girls is obscene, it was not like to have been transcribed by either Meisters or Septums. Given the number of copies known to exist, hundreds, though as many more were burned by Baylor the Blessed, the scribes responsible were most likely Septums expelled from the faith for drunkenness, theft or fornication, failed students who left the citadel without a chain, hired quills from the free cities or murmurs, the worst of all, Lacking the rigour of Meisters, such scribes oft feel free to improve on the text they are copying. Rumours in particular are prone to this. In a case of a caution for young girls, such improvements largely consisted of adding ever more episodes of depravity and changing the existing episodes to make them even more disturbing and less, less vicious. As alteration followed alteration over the years, it became even more difficult to ascertain which was the original text, to the extent that even Meisters at the Citadel cannot agree as to the title of the book, as has been noted. The identity of the man who met Graham Wilde in the inn by the ferry is indeed such a meeting, if indeed such a meeting ever took place, is another matter of contention. In the copies entitled Sins of the Flesh and The High and the Low, which tend to be the older versions and the shortest, the man in the inn is identified as Sir Boris Baratheon, eldest of Lord Rogar's four brothers. In a wanton's tale and the wickedness of men, however, the man is Lord Rogar himself. All these versions agree on what happened next. Dismissing Lady Corian's father and her brother, the Lord commanded the girl to disrobe so he might inspect her. He ran his hands over every part of me, she wrote, and bled me turn this way and that, and bend and stretch and open my legs to his gaze, until at last he pronounced himself satisfied. Only then did the man reveal the purpose of the summons that had brought her to King's Landing. She was to be sent to Dragonstone, a supposed maid, to serve as one Queen Alicene's companions, but once there she was to use her wiles and her body to beguile the king into bed. Jaharis is a man made like as not, and besotted with his sister. This man supposedly told her, but Alicene is but a child, and you are a woman any man would want. Once his grace tastes your charms, he may come to see his senses and abandon this folly of a marriage. He may even choose to keep you afterward, who can say? There could be no question of marriage, of course, but you would have jewels, servants, whatever you might want. There are rich rewards in being a king's bed warmer. If Alicene should discover you a bed together, so much the better. She is a prideful girl and would be quick to abandon an unfaithful spouse. And if you should get with child again, you and the babe will be well taken care of and your father and mother will be richly rewarded for your service to the crown. Can we put any credence in this tale? At this late date, so far removed from the events in question, with all the principles long dead, there is no way to be certain. Beyond the testimony of the girl herself, we have no source to verify this meeting by the ferry ever took place. And if some Baratheon did indeed meet privily with Corian Wilde before she reached King's Landing, we cannot know what words he might have spoken to her. He could as easily have simply been instructing her in her duties as a spy and tattle, as the other girls had been instructed. Archmeister Cray, writing in the Citadel in the last years of King Jaharis' long reign, believed that the meeting at the inn was a clumsy calumny intended to blacken the name of Lord Rugar, and went so far as to attribute the lie to Sir Boris Baratheon himself, who quarrelled bitterly with his brother in later life. 
Other scholars, including Meister Rabin, the Citadel's foremost expert on banned, forbidden, fraudulent and obscene texts, put the story down as no more than a body tale of the sort known to excite the lust of young boys, bastards, whores and the men who partake of their favours. Amongst the small folk, there were always men of a lascivious character who delight in the tales of great lords and noble knights despoiling maidens, Rabin wrote. For this persuades them that their betters share their own base lusts. Mayhaps, yet there are certain things that we do know beyond a doubt that may allow us to draw our own conclusions. We do know that the younger daughter of Morgan Wilde, Lord of the Rainhouse, was deflowered at an early age and gave birth to a bastard boy. We can be reasonably certain that Lord Rogar knew of her shame. Not only was he Lord Morgor's liege, but the child was placed in his own household. We know that Corian Wilde was amongst the maids who were sent to Dragonstone as companions for Queen Alicene. A singularly curious choice, if a lady in waiting was all she was meant to be, for scores of other young girls of noble birth and suitable age were also available, girls whose maiden heads were intact and whose virtue was beyond reproach. Why her? Many have asked in the years since. She did have some special gift, some particular charm. If so, no one remarked on it at the time. Could Lord Rogar or Queen Elisa have been indebted to her Lord Father or Lady Mother for some past favour or kindness? We have no record of it. No plausible explanation for the selection of Corian Wilde has ever been offered, save for the simple, ugly answer preferred by a caution for young girls. She was sent to Dragonstone not for Alicene, but for Jaharis. Court records indicate that Septa Isabel, Lady Lucinda and the other women chosen for Alicene Targaryen's household boarded the trading galley, Wise Woman, at dawn on the seventh day of the second moon of 50 AC and left for Dragonstone on the morning tide. Queen Elisa had sent word of their coming ahead by Raven, yet even so she had some concern that the Wise Woman, as they became known from that day forth, would find the gates of Dragonstone close to them. Her fears were unfounded. The little queen and two Kingsguard met them at the harbour as they disembarked, and Alicene welcomed each and every one with glad smiles and gifts. Before we relate what happened afterward, let us turn our gaze briefly to Fur Isle, where Rihanna Targaryen, the queen in the west, resided with her new husband and a court of her own. It will be recalled that Queen Elisa had been no more pleased by her eldest daughter's third marriage than by the one her son would soon make. Though Queen Rihanna's marriage was of less consequence. She was not alone in this, for in truth, Andrew Farman was a curious choice for one with the blood of the dragon in her veins. The second son of Lord Farman, not even the heir, Andrew was said to be a handsome boy with pale blue eyes and long flaxen hair, but he was nine years younger than the Queen, and even at his own father's court, there were those who scorned him as half a girl himself, for he was soft of speech and gentle of nature. A singular failure as a squire, he had never become a knight, having none of the martial skills of his lord father and elder brother. For a time, his sire had considered sending him to Old Town to forge a master's chain, until his own master told him that the boy was simply not clever enough and could hardly read nor write. Later, when asked why she had chosen such an unpromising spouse, Rihanna Targaryen replied, he was kind to me. Andrew's father had been kind to her as well, offering her refuge on the Fur Isle after the battle beneath the God's Eye, when her uncle, King Magor, was demanding her capture and the poor fellows of the realm were denouncing her as a vile sinner and her daughters as abominations. Some have put forward the suggestion that the widowed queen took Andrew as her husband in part to repay his father for that kindness, for Lord Farman, himself a second son who had never expected to rule, was known to have great fondness for Andrew despite his deficiencies. Mayhaps there is some truth in that ascertain, but another possibility, first put forward by Lord Farman's Meister, may cut closer to the bone. The Queen found her true love in Fur Isle, Meister Smike wrote to the Citadel, not with Andrew, but with his sister, Lady Elisa. Three years, Andrew's elder, Elisa Farman shared her brother's blue eyes and long flaxen hair, 
but elsewhere she was as unlike him as a sibling can be. Sharp of wit and sharper of tongue, she loved horses, dogs and hawks. She was a fine singer and a skilled dancer and a skilled archer, but her great love was sailing. The wind our steed were the words of the farmans of Fur Isle, who had sailed the western seas since the dawn age. And Lady Elisa embodied them. As a child it was said she spent more time at sea than upon her land. Her father's crews used to laugh to see her climbing the rigging like a monkey. She sailed her own boat around the Fur Isle at the age of four and ten. And by the time she was twenty she had voyaged as far north as Burr Island and as far south as the arbour. Oft times to the horror of her lord father and lady mother she spoke of her desire to take a ship beyond the western horizon to learn what strange and wondrous lands might lie on the far side of the sunset sea. Lady Elisa had been twice betrothed, once at twelve and once at sixteen, but she had frightened off both boys as her father admitted ruefully. In Rihanna Targaryen, however, she found a like-minded companion and in her the Queen found a new confidant. Together with Elaine Royce and Samantha Stokeworth, two of Rihanna's oldest friends, they became nigh inseparable. A court within the court that Sir Franklin Farman, Lord Mark's elder son, dubbed the Four-Headed Beast. Andrew Farman, Rihanna's new husband, was admitted to their circle from time to time, but never so often as to be taken for a fifth head. Most tellingly, Queen Rihanna never took him flying with her on the back of her dragon, Dreamfire, an adventure she shared frequently with the ladies Elisa, Elaine and Sam. In fairness, it is more than possible that the Queen invited Andrew to share the sky with her, only to have him decline, for he was not of an adventurous disposition. It would be a mistake to regard Queen Rihanna's time at Fircastle as an idol, however. Not everyone welcomed her presence by any means. Even here, on this distant isle, there were poor fellows, angered that Lord Mark, like his father before him, had given support and sanctuary to one of them regarded as an enemy of the faith. The continued presence of Dreamfire on the island was also creating problems. Glimpsed every few years, a dragon was a wonder and a terror to behold, and it was true that some of the Fur Islanders took pride in having a dragon of their own. Others, however, were made anxious by the presence of the great beast, especially as she grew larger and hungrier. Feeding a grown dragon is no small thing, and when it became known that Dreamfire had produced a clutch of dragon eggs, a begging brother from the inland hills began to preach that Fur Isle would soon be overrun by dragons, devouring sheep and cows and men alike, unless a dragon slayer came forth to put an end to the scourge. Lord Foreman sent forth knights to seize the man and silence him, but not before thousands had heard his prophecies. Though the preacher died in the dungeons under Fir Castle, his words lived on, filling the ignorant with fear wherever they were heard. Even within the walls of Lord Farman's own seat, Queen Rihanna had enemies, chief amongst them his lordship's heir. Sir Franklin had fought in the battle beneath the god's eye and taken a wound there, bloodshed in the service of Prince Aegon the Uncrowned. His grandsire had died upon that battlefield together with his eldest son, and it had been left to him to bring their corpses home to Fur Isle. Yet it seemed to him that Rihanna Targaryen showed little remorse for all the grief she had brought to House Farman, and little gratitude to him personally. He had also resented her friendship with his sister, Elisa. Instead of encouraging her in what he regarded as her wild, willful ways, Sir Franklin thought the Queen should be enjoying her to do her duty to her house by making an appropriate marriage and producing children. Nor did he appreciate the manner in which the four-headed beast had somehow become the centre of court life at Fircastle, whilst his lord father and himself were increasingly disregarded. In that he was well justified. More and more high-born lords from the Westerlands and beyond were visiting Fir Isle, Meister Smike noted, but when they came it was to have an audience with the Queen in the West, not with the minor lordling of Small Isle and his son. None of this was a great concern to the Queen and her familiars, so long as Mark Farman ruled in Fircastle. For his lordship was an amiable and good-natured man who loved all his children, his wayward daughter and weakling son included.
and loved Rihanna Targaryen for loving them as well. Less than a fortnight after the Queen and Andrew Furman had celebrated their first anniversary of their union, however, Lord Mark died suddenly at his own table, choking to death upon a fishbone at the age of six and forty. And with this passing, Sir Franklin became the Lord of Fur Isle. He wasted little time. On the day after his father's funeral, he summoned Rihanna to his great hall. He would not deign to go to her, and commanded her to remove herself from his island. You are not wanted here, he told her. You are not welcome here. Take your dragon with you, and your friends, and my little brother, who would surely piss me his breeches if he were made to stay. But do not presume to take my sister. She will remain here, and she will be wed to a man of my choosing. Franklin Farman did not lack for courage, as Meister Smike wrote in a letter to the Citadel. He did lack for sense, however, and in that moment, he did not seem to realise how close he stood to death. I could see the fire in her eyes, the Meister said, and for a moment, I could see Fircastle burning, the white towers blackening and collapsing into the sea as flames leapt from every window and the dragon wheeled about again and again. Rihanna Targaryen was the blood of the dragon, and far too proud to linger longer where she was not wanted. She departed for her that very night, taking wing for Casterly Rock upon Dreamfire, after instructing her husband and companions to follow her by ship. With all those who might love me, when Andrew flushed with anger, offered to face his brother in single combat, the Queen quickly dissuaded him. He would cut you to pieces, my love, she told him. And were I to be thrice widowed, men would name me a witch or worse, and hound me from Westeros. Lyman Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, had sheltered her before, she reminded him. Queen Rihanna was confident that he would welcome her again. Andrew Farman, Samantha Stokeworth and Aileen Royce set out to follow the next morning, together with more than 40 of the Queen's friends, servants and hangers-on. For her grace had gathered a sizable coterie about her as the Queen in the West. Lady Elisa was with them as well, for she had no intention of remaining behind. Her ship, the Maiden's Fancy, had been made ready for the crossing. When the Queen's party reached the docks, however, they found Sir Franklin waiting for them. The rest of them could go, and good riddance, he announced, but a sister would remain on Fair Isle to be wed. The new lord had brought only half a dozen men with him, however, and he had seriously misjudged the love the small folk bore his sister, particularly the sailors, shipwrights, fisherfolk, porters, and other Denzians of the dockside districts many of whom had known her since she was a small girl. As Lady Elisa confronted her brother, spitting defiance at him and demanding that he get out of her way, a crowd gathered around them, growing angrier by the moment. Oblivious to their mood, his lordship attempted to seize his sister, whereupon the onlookers rushed forward, overwhelming his men before they could draw their blades. Three of them were shoved off the docks into the water, that whilst Lord Franklin himself was thrown into the ship's hold, full of fresh-caught cod. Eliza Farman and the rest of the Queen's friends boarded, Maiden's Fancy, untouched, and set sail for Lannisport. Lyman Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, had given Rihanna and her husband Aegon, the Uncrowned, refuge when Megor the Cruel was demanding their heads. His bastard son, Sir Tyler Hill, had fought with Prince Aegon under the God's Eye. His wife, the formidable Lady Jocasta of House Tarbeck had befriended Rihanna during her time at the Rock and had been first to discern that she was with child. Just as the Queen had expected, they welcomed her now, and when the rest of her party landed in Lannisport, the Lannisters took them in as well. A lavish feast was held in their honour, an entire stable was given over to Dreamfire, and Queen Rihanna, her husband, and her companions of the four-headed beast were assigned a regally appointed suite of apartments deep in the bowels of the rock itself, safe from any harm. There they lingered for more than a moon's turn, enjoying the hospitality of the wealthiest house in all of Westeros. As the days passed, however, that very hospitality grew even more disquieting to Rana Targaryen. It became apparent to her that the bedmaids and servants aside to them were tattlers and spies, 
bringing word of their every doing back to Lord and Lady Lannister. One of the castle septers asked Samantha Stokeworth whether the Queen's marriage to Andrew Fireman had ever been consummated, and if so, who had witnessed the betting? Sir Tyler Hill, Lord Lywin's commonly bastard son, was openly scornful of Andrew, even whilst doing all he could to ingratiate himself to Rihanna herself, regaling her with tales of his exploits at the battle beneath the God's Eye and showing her the scars he had taken there. In your Aegon's service, Lord Lyman himself began to express an unseemly interest in the three dragon eggs that the Queen had brought from Fair Isle, wondering how and when they might be expected to hatch. His wife, Lady Jocasta, suggested privately that one or more eggs would be a fine gift if Her Grace should wish to show her gratitude to House Lannister for taking her in. When that ploy proved unsuccessful, Lord Lyman offered to buy the eggs outright for a staggering sum of gold. The Lord of Casterly Rock wanted more than just a high-born guest, Queen Rihanna realised then. Beneath the warmth of his veneer, he was too cunning and too ambitious to settle for so little. He wanted an alliance with the Iron Throne, possibly through marriage between her and his bastard, or one of his true-born sons. Some union that would raise the Lannisters up past the Hightowers, the Baratheons, the Valerians, to be the second house in the realm. And he wanted dragons. With dragon riders of their own, the Lannisters would be the equals of the Targaryens. They were kings once, she reminded Sam Stokeworth. He smiles, but he was raised on tales of the field of fire. He will not have forgotten. Rihanna Targaryen knew her history as well. The history of the freehold of Valeria, written blood and fire. We cannot remain here, she confided to her dear companions. There we must leave Queen Rihanna for a time, whilst we cast our eyes eastward again towards King's Landing and Dragonstone, where the regent and king remained at odds. Vexing as the issue of the king's marriage was to Queen Elisa and Lord Rogar, it must not be thought that it was the only matter that concerned them during their regency. Coin, or rather lack of coin, was the crown's most pressing problem. King Magor's wars had been ruinously expensive, exhausting the royal treasury. To refill his coffers, Magor's master of coin had raised existing taxes and imposed new ones. But these measures brought in less gold than anticipated and only served to deepen the anathema with which the lords of the realm regarded the king. Nor had the situation improved with the ascension of Jaharis. The young prince's coronation and his mother's golden wedding had both been splendid affairs that had done much to win him the love of the lords and small folk alike, but all that had come at a cost. An even larger expense loomed ahead. Lord Rugar was determined to complete work on the dragon pit before handing the city and the kingdom over to Jaharis, but the funds were lacking. Edwell Celtigar, Lord of Claw Isle, had been an ineffectual hand for Magor the Cruel. Given a second chance under the Regency, he proved to be an equally ineffectual master of coin. Unwillingly to offend his fellow lords, Celtigar instead decided to impose new taxes on the small folk of King's Landing, who were conveniently close at hand. Port fees were tripled, certain goods were to be taxed both coming into and out of the city, and new levies were to be asked of innkeeps and builders. None of these measures had the desired effect of filling up the treasury vaults. Instead, buildings slowed to a halt, the inns emptied, the trade declined, notably as merchants diverted their ships from King's Landing to Driftmark, Duckensdale, Maidenpool and other ports where they might evade taxation. Lannisport and Old Town, the other great cities of the realm, were also included in Lord Celticar's new taxes. But there, the decrees had less effect largely because Castle Rock and the High Tower ignored them and made no effort to collect. The new levies did, however, serve to make Lord Celtigar loathe throughout the city. Lord Rogar and Queen Elisa received their share of opprobrium as well. Another casualty was the Dragon Pit. The Crown no longer had the funds to pay the builders and all work on the Great Dome ceased. Storms were gathering to both north and south as well. With Lord Rugar occupied in King's Landing, the Dornishmen had grown bold. 
raiding more frequently into the marches and even troubling the stormlands. There were rumours of another vulture king in the Red Mountains and Lord Rugar's brothers, Boris and Garin, insisted they not have the men and money required to root him out. Even more dire was the situation in the north. Brandon Stark, Lord of Winterfell, had died in 49 AC, not long after his return from the Golden Wedding. The journey, the Northmen said, had asked too much of him. His son Walton succeeded him, and when a sudden rebellion broke out in 50 AC amongst the men of the Night's Watch at Rhymegate and Sable Hall, he gathered his strength and rode to the wall to join the Lale Watchmen in putting them down. The rebels were former poor fellows and warrior sons who had accepted clemency from the boy king. Led by Sir Oliver Bracken and Sir Raymond Mallory, the two turncloaked knights who had served on Magor's Kingsguard before abandoning him for Jaharis. The Lord Commander of the Watch unwisely had given Bracken and Mallory command of two crumbling forts with orders to restore them. Instead, the two men decided to make their castles their own seats and establish themselves as lords. Their uprising proved short-lived. For every man of the Night's Watch who joined their rebellion, ten remained true to their vows. Once joined by Lord Stark and his bannermen, the Black Brothers retook Rhymegate and hanged the Oathbreakers, save for Sir Oliver himself, who was beheaded by Lord Stark with his celebrated blade, Ice. When word reached Sable Hall, the rebels there fled beyond the wall in hopes of making common cause with the wildlings. Lord Walton pursued them, but two days north in the snows of the haunted forest, he and his men were set upon by giants. It was written afterward that Walton Stark slew two of them before he was dragged from his saddle and torn apart. His surviving men carried him back to Castle Black in pieces. As for Sir Raymond Mallory and the other deserters, the wildlings gave them a cold welcome. Rebels or no, the free folk had no use for crows. Sir Raymond's head was delivered to Eastwatch half a year later. When asked what had befallen the rest of his men, the wildland chieftain laughed and said, We ate them. Brandon Stark's second son, Alaric, became the Lord of Winterfell. He would rule the north for 23 years, an able man, though a stern one. But for a long while he had no good to say of King Jaharis, for he blamed the king's clemency for his brother Walton's death, and was oft heard to say that his grace should have beheaded Magor's men rather than sending them to the wall. Far removed from the troubles in the north, King Jaharis and Queen Alisain remained in their self-imposed exile from the court, but they were anything but idle. Jaharis continued his rigorous training regime with the knights of his king guard every morn and devoted his evenings to pouring over accounts of the reign of his grandsire, Aegon the Conqueror, on which he wished to model his own rule. Dragonstone's three maesters assisted him in these inquiries, as did the Queen. As the days passed, more and more visitors made their way to Dragonstone to talk with the King. Lord Macy of Stonedance was the first to appear, but Lord Staunton of Rook's Rest, Lord Darklin of Duckensdale, and Lord Bar Armin of Sharp Point came hard on his heels, followed by the Lords Hart, Rollingford, Mouton and Stokeworth. Young Lord Rosby, whose father had taken his own life when King Magor fell, turned up as well, sheepishly pleading for the young man's forgiveness, which Jaharis was pleased to grant. Though Damon Valera, as the Crown's Lord Admiral and Master of Ships, was in King's Landing with the Regents, that did not prevent Jaharis and Alisane from flying their dragons to Driftmark and touring his shipyards, escorted by his sons, Corin, Jorgen and Victor. When word of these meetings reached Lord Rogar in King's Landing, he grew furious and went so far as to ask Lord Damon if the Valerian fleet could be used to prevent these Lords Lickspittle from crawling to Dragonstone to curry favour with the Boy King. Lord Valerian's reply was blunt. No, he said. The Hand took this as a further sign of disrespect. Meanwhile, Queen Alicene's new ladies-in-waiting and companions had settled in on Dragonstone, and it soon became apparent that her mother's hope that these wise women might persuade the little queen that her marriage was unwise and impious had gone seriously away. Neither prayer, sermons, 
No readings from the seven-pointed star could shake Alassane Targaryen's conviction that the gods had meant her to marry her brother Jaharis, to be his confidant and helpmate and the mother of his children. He will be a king, she told Septa Isabel, Lady Lucinda and the others, and I will be a great queen. So firm was she in belief, and so gentle and kindly and loving in all else, that the Septa and the other wise women found they could not condemn her, and with every passing day they clove more to her side. Lord Rugar's own plan to drive Jaharis and Alassane apart fared no better. The young king and his queen were to spend their lives together, and though they would famously quarrel and part later in life, only to reunite, Septon Oswick and Master Culliper both tell us that never a cloud nor a harsh word troubled their time together in Dragonstone before Jaharis reached his majority. Did Corrin Wilde fail to bed the king? Is it possible that she never made an attempt? Is the whole tale of the meeting at the end mayhaps a fiction? Any of these are possible. The author of A Caution for Young Girls would have it otherwise. But here the infamous text becomes even more unreliable, splintering off into half a dozen contradictory versions of events, even more vulgar than the last. It would not do for the wanton of the heart of that tale to admit that Jaharis had rejected her, or that she never found the opportunity to lure him into her bedchamber. Instead, we are offered an assortment of lewd adventures, a veritable feast of filth. A wanton's tale insists that Lady Corrine not only bedded the king, but also all seven members of the Kingsguard. His grace supposedly gave her to Pete the Woodcock after he had sated his own lusts. Pete passed her to Sir Joffrey in turn, and so it went. The high and the low omits those details, but tells us that Jaharis not only welcomed the girl into his bed, but also brought Queen Alicene into frolic with them in the episodes most often associated with the infamous pleasure houses of lice. A somewhat more plaudible tale is told in The Sins of Flesh, wherein Corrin Wilde does indeed lure King Jaharis into her bed, only to find him fumbling, uncertain and over hasty, as many boys of his age are known to be when first to bed with a maid. By that time, however, Lady Corrine had grown to admire and respect Queen Alicene, as if she were my own little sister, and had developed warm feelings for Jaharis as well. Instead of attempting to undo the king's marriage, therefore, she took it upon herself to help make it a success by educating his grace in the art of giving and receiving carnal pleasure, so that he might not prove incapable when the time came to bed his young wife. This tale could well be as fanciful as the others, but it has a certain sweetness to it that has led some scholars to allow that it might, mayhaps, have happened. Lewd fables are not history, however, and history only has one thing sure to tell us about Lady Corrine of House Wild, the putative author of A Caution for Young Girls. On the 15th day of the 6th moon of 50 AC, she departed Dragonstone under the cover of night in the company of Sir Howard Bullock, the younger son of the commander of the castle garrison. A married man, Sir Howard left his wife behind him, though he took most of her jewellery. A fishing boat carried him and Lady Corrine to Driftmark, where they took ship for the free city of Pentos. From there, they made their way to disputed lands, where Sir Howard signed on to a free company called with a singular lack of inspiration, the Free Company. He would die in mire three years later, not in battle, but in a fall from his horse after a night of drinking. Alone and penniless, Corrin Wilde moved to the next of the trials, tribulations and erotic adventures recounted in her book. We need hear no more of her. By the time word of Lady Corrine's flight were the purloined jewels and purloined husband reached the ears of Lord Rugar in the Red Keep, it had become obvious that his plan had failed, as had Queen Elisa's. Piety and lust had both proved unable to break the bond between Jaharis Targaryen and his Alassane. Moreover, word of King's marriage had begun to spread. Too many men had witnessed the confrontation at the castle gates, and the lords who had called at Dragonstone afterward had not failed to notice Alassane's presence at the king's side, or the obvious affection between them. 
Rugar Baratheon might talk of tearing out tongues, but he was helpless against the whispers that spread throughout the land, and even across the narrow sea, where the magisters of Pentos and the sellswords of the Free Company were doubtlessly entertained by the tales Corrin Wilde had to tell. It is done, the Queen Regent told her councillors when she realised the truth at last. It is done and cannot be undone. Seven save us. We must needs live with it and we must use all our powers to protect them from what may come. She had lost two sons to Magor the Cruel and a coldness lay between her and her oldest daughter. She could not bear the thought of being forever estranged from the two children who remained to her. Rugar Baratheon could not yield as gracefully, however, and his wife's words woke him in a fury. In front of Grandmeister Benefer, Septim Matthias, Lord Valeron, and the rest, he spoke to her contemptuously. You are weak, he declared, as weak as your first husband was, as weak as your son. Sentiment may be forgiven in a mother, but not in a regent, and never in a king. We were fools to crown Jaharis. He thinks only of himself, and he will be a worse king than his father was. Thank the gods that it is not too late. We must act now and put him aside. A hush fell over the chamber at those words. The Queen Regent stared at her lord husband in horror, and then, as if to prove that he had spoken truly, began to weep, her tears running silent down her cheeks. Only then did the other lords find their tongues. Have you taken leave of your senses? asked Lord Valeron. Lord Corbray, commander of the City Watch, shook his head and said, My men will never stand for it. Grandmeister Benefer exchanged a glance with Prentice Tully, the Master of Laws. Lord Tully said, Do you mean to claim the Iron Throne for yourself then? This Lord Rugar denied vehemently. Never do you take me for a usurper. I want only what is best for the Seven Kingdoms. No harm need come to Jaharis. We can send him to Old Town, to the Citadel. He is a bookish boy. A maester's chain will suit him. Then who shall sit the Iron Throne? demanded Lord Seltagar. Princess Araya, Lord Rugar answered at once. There is a fire in her Jaharis does not have. She is young, but I can continue as her hand. Shape her, guide her, teach her all she must know. She has a stronger claim. Her mother and father were King Aenys first and second born. Jaharis was fourth. His fist slammed against the table then, Benefer tells us. Her mother will support her, Queen Rihanna, and Rihanna has a dragon. Grandmaster Benefer recorded what followed. A silence fell, though the same words were on the lips of us all. Jaharis and Alisane have dragons too. Carl Corbury had fought in the battle beneath the god's eye. He had witnessed the terrible sight of dragon fighting dragon. For the rest of us, the hand's words conjured visions of old Valeria before the doom, when Dragon Lord contended with Dragon Lord for supremacy. It was an awful vision. It was Queen Elisa who broke the spell through her tears. I am the Queen Regent, she reminded them. Until my son shall come of age, all of you serve at my pleasure, including the hand of the king. When she turned to her lord husband, Benefer tells us that her eyes looked as hard and dark as obsidian. Your service no longer pleases me, Lord Rugar. Leave us and return to Storm's End, and we need never speak of your treason. Rugar Baratheon looked at her incredulously. Woman, you think you can dismiss me? He laughed, no. That was when Lord Corbray rose to his feet and drew his sword, the Valerian steel blade called Lady Forlan, that was the pride of his house. Yes, he said, and laid the blade upon the table, its point toward Lord Rugar. Then, and only then, did his lordship realise that he had gone too far, that he stood alone against every man in the room, or so Benefer tells us. His lordship said no further word. His face pale, he stood and removed the golden brooch that Queen Elisa had given him as a token of, of his office, flung it at her contemptuously and strode from the room. He took his leave of King's Landing that very night, crossing the Blackwater Rush with his brother Oren. There he lingered for six days whilst his brother Ronald assembled their knights and men-at-arms for the march home. Legend tells us 
that Lord Rogar awaited their coming in the self same inn beside the ferry where he or his brother Boris had met with Corn Wild. When the Baratheon brothers and their levies finally set out for Storm's End, they had barely half as many men as had marched with them two years before to top of Magor. The rest, it would seem, preferred the alleys and inns and temptations of the great city to the rainy woods, green hills and moss-covered cottages of the Stormlands. I never lost so many men in battle as I did to the flesh pots and alehouses of King's Landing, Lord Rogar would say bitterly. One of those lost was Arya Targaryen. On the night of Lord Rogar's dismissal, Sir Ronald Baratheon and a dozen of his men forced their way into her chambers in the Red Keep, intending to take her with them, only to find that Queen Elisa had stolen a march on them. The girl was already gone, and her servants knew not where. It would be learned later that Lord Corbury had removed her at the Queen Regent's command, dressed in the rags of a common girl of the lowest order, with her silver hair dyed a muddy brown. Princess Arya would spend the rest of the Regency working in a stable near the King's Gate. She was eight years old and loved horses. Years later, she would say that this was the happiest time of her life. Sad to say, there was to be little happiness for Queen Elisa in the years to come. Her dismissal of her husband as the hand of the king had destroyed any affection that Lord Rogar might have ever felt for her. From that day forth, their marriage was a ruined castle, an empty shell haunted by ghosts. Elisa Valeron had survived the death of her husband and her two eldest sons, a daughter who perished in the cradle, years of terror under Magor the Cruel, and a rift with her remaining children. But she could not survive this, Septon Barth would write, when he looked back upon her life, it shattered her. Contemporary reports from Grindmeister Benefer agree. With Lord Rugar gone, Queen Elisa named her brother Damon Valeron as Hand of the King, dispatched a raven to Dragonstone to tell her son Jaharis, some, but not all, of what had occurred, and then retired to her chambers in Magor's Holdfast. For the remainder of her regency, she left the rule of the Seven Kingdoms to Lord Damon and took no further part in public life. It would be pleasant to report that Rugar Baratheon, once back at Storm's End, reflected on the error of his ways, repented his mistakes and became a chastened man. Sadly, that was not his lordship's nature. He was a man who knew not how to yield. The taste of defeat was like bile in the back of his throat. In war, he would boast he would never lay down his axe whilst life remained in his body. And this matter of the king's marriage had become a war to him. One he was determined to win. One last folly remained to him and he did not shrink from it. Thus it was that in old town, at the mother house attached to the starry sept, Sir Arm Baratheon appeared suddenly with a dozen men at arms and a letter bearing Lord Rago's seal, demanding that the novice Rael of Targaryen be turned over to them immediately. When questioned, Sir Arryn would say only that Lord Rogar had urgent need of the girl at Storm's End. The ploy might well have worked, but Septa Caroline, who had the door of the mother house that day, had a spine of steel and a suspicious nature. Whilst placating Sir Arryn with the pretexting of sending for the girl, she sent and said for the High Septum. His High Holiness was, mayhaps fortunately for both the child and the realm, asleep. But a steward, a former knight, who had been a captain in the warrior's sons until they were abolished, was awake and weary. In place of a frightened girl, the Baratheon men found themselves confronted by 30 armed septums under the command of the steward, Caspar Straw. When Sir Arm brandished a sword, Straw calmly informed him that two score of the Lord's Hightower's knights were on their way, a lie as it happened, but whereupon the Baratheons surrendered. Under questioning, Sir Arryn confessed the entire plot. He was to deliver the girl to Storm's End, where Lord Rogar planned to force her to confess that she was the actual Princess Arya, not Riella, that he meant to name her Queen. The father of the faithful, a man as gentle as he was weak of will, heard Arryn Baratheon's confession and forgave him. This did not prevent Lord Hightower, once informed, from throwing the captive Baratheons into a dungeon and dispatching a full account of the affair 
to both the Red Cape and Dragonstone. Donald Hightower, who had rightly been named Donald Dallaire for his reluctance to take the field against Septim Moon and his followers, seemed to have no fear of offending Storm's End by imprisoning Rogar's own brother. Let him come and try and prize him free, he said when his master worried about how the former hand might react. His own wife took his hand and cut his balls off, and soon enough the king will have his head. Across the width of Westeros, Rogar Baratheon fumed and raged when he learned of his brother's failure and imprisonment, but he did not call his banners, had many had feared. Instead, he fell into despair. I am done, he told his own maester glumly. It is a wall for me, if the gods are good. If not, the boy will have my head and make a gift of it to his mother. Having sired no children by either of his wives, he commanded his maester to draft a will and confession, wherein he absolved his brothers Boris, Garin and Ronald of having played any role in his wrongdoing, begged for mercy for his bro youngest brother, Oren, and named Sir Boris as heir to Storm's End. All I did and all I tried to do was for the good of the realm and the Iron Throne, he ended. His lordship would not have long to wait to know his fate. The Regency was almost at an end. With the former Hand and Queen Regent both wounded and silent, Lord Damon Valeron and the remaining members of the Queen's Council ruled the realm as best they could, saying little and doing less, in the words of Grandmaster Benefer. On the 20th day of the ninth moon of 50 AC, Jaharis Targaryen reached his 16th name day and became a man grown. By the laws of the Seven Kingdoms, he was now old enough to rule in his own right, with no further need of a regent. All across the Seven Kingdoms, lords and small folk alike waited to see what kind of king he would be. And we too must also wait. Guys, thanks again for joining me for this chapter. We'll have more chapters for you to get the whole story of Fire and Blood before House of the Dragon comes up and they'll be coming up in the coming weeks and months. So guys, like, share, subscribe. Join us on Sunday for our rewatches. Currently doing season three of Game of Thrones. And until then, as usual, for the one.